Well this is new, huh? For today's video, I want to talk about the movie diary that I have on Letterboxd, so basically what I was able to watch in March of this year. Also, if you haven't yet, follow my Letterboxd account because maybe we might have some films we like to talk about? There's been a ton of films out there that came out recently and I just want to focus on the ones I was able to watch this month. Or I should say past month, no, last month. Because this is going to be a late release, since it's, this is going to be like releasing almost at the end of April, so yeah. Whether it was films that came out in theaters, digitally, or films I saw in my cinema class, that's how this is going to work out. So how this will work out is basically just giving a small summary of the story of the film that I just watched and give my overall thoughts and opinions. Now that doesn't mean that these films will get their own reviews, some will and some won't. So I'll basically give a short review on it and save the rest of it for the actual review. And that's pretty much it, so let's get started shall we? First off on the list is Dune Part 2. Now I remember watching part 1 at home during the pandemic and I really enjoyed it. My dad is a huge fan of the original 1984 film and was surprised by how well they did with part 1. With part 2 coming out, we were both excited to see how it will go, and it didn't disappoint. If you haven't seen Dune part 2 yet, go and watch the film either in theaters or in digital. It's an incredibly immersive film that has such gorgeous cinematography, brilliant acting, a rich musical score, awesome sound design that really makes you feel like you're in the film, and a story that just keeps you interested in the film. Dune Part 2 is something you have to watch in order to believe in the hype. It's so damn good. And then I rewatched Barbie in my cinema class. I'm not gonna say anything else because I've already made a review on this, but overall, it's fucking Barbie. It's a masterpiece. Go and check out my review and hear why I think it's great. Next I saw Orion and the Dark. No joke, this is probably one of the best films DreamWorks Animation has ever made in my opinion. It follows a young boy named Orion struggling to conquer his fears, especially his fear of the dark. As dark, yes, the actual darkness you see, tries to get him to conquer his fears. The themes really play a big part within the film, and they are executed greatly, where we can't just hold on to our fears, we have to confront them. Otherwise, what can we even do in our lives if we're scared of everything? The story that mixes in with this message is really sweet, and it presents itself in a way where it makes the themes feel simple and understandable to learn, but more mature and realistic when they present it. To me, the way Orion executes itself is rather mature. This is one of the few DreamWorks animated films where I believe it's more focused on teens and adults rather than kids. It sort of reminds me of Pixar's Soul in a way, where the animation is colorful and lively, but the story, messages, and themes are presented in a mature way. The writing is really clever and dark when it focuses on more, I guess, adult topics. The characters are energetic and cute, and while the final act of the story is pretty odd and out of place, the surprises that the film delivers in its story will leave you feeling surprised, yet really happy with how it all plays out. Next I saw words bubble up like soda pop. This is such an adorable movie to watch. It focuses on a shy young boy who writes haikus and a poppy young girl who is an influencer and hides her buck tooth teeth. And I seriously love these types of simple love stories like this. While the drama in the story feels pointless and could have been done way better, the film flies high with its colorful animation, bopping soundtrack, and a story that is so simple yet feels charming to see unfold, and along with like a great cast of characters and a love story that develops really well, especially with its pacing. If you want to see a really cute summer love story, give this film a watch. It's really good. Then I saw Kung Fu Panda 4. Thank you Cub Click for giving me free tickets to watch this. I already talked about this film in like a review, but to summarize it, this is basically the weakest Kung Fu Panda movie yet. The story was extremely predictable, the villain is great but barely has any reason to exist, making her feel pretty underdeveloped, and the comedy is a huge mixed bag. While it did have some really great anime style action scenes, great animation, and a phenomenal musical score, the film didn't have the same charm as the original three films from before, and sadly it doesn't live up to the hype of those past films. Next I saw The Wonderful Story of Henry Sugar. I don't know, I thought that was, this one was just pretty meh to be honest. I love Wes Anderson, I think his cinematography is iconic and extremely imaginative, but the way the film presents itself makes it clear that his style of film is starting to become a bit repetitive. To the point that it's getting kind of annoying. It would be really cool if he does something different that he hasn't done yet. The acting was fine, the story is pretty confusing and drags on a bit in some scenes, but its execution was well done. There's honestly not much I can say about this film. It's fine for what it is, I just don't think it really left a big impression on me. Then I saw Spaceman. It tells the story of an astronaut who's journeying to the edge of the solar system but also experiencing some hardships in his relationship with his wife. 
but soon a spider white creature arrives on the ship and wants to help him fix his relationship. This story alone sounds interesting, and it's delivered in a really unique way where it exports how fragile a relationship can be to some. The words we say, the actions we do, they all have consequences that can break apart a relationship. The film delivers it in a sad, yet realistic way by delivering an important message that is seen throughout the film. You can't run away from your problems or mistakes. You have to confront them. Otherwise, you'll only worsen the situation. The visual effects were great. The acting was fantastic, especially by Sandler. The story is painful, yet it's realistic with its execution. The characters feel relatable. The cinematography is really created with its shots. Spaceman delivers a heartfelt and depressing drama that makes this film an underrated piece of art. Next up, I saw Maestro. Maestro tells the story of the relationship of a famed composer and his wife, and the difficulties that presents themselves throughout their lives. Bradley Cooper was pretty questionable with his acting, to be honest. It wasn't bad at all, he did fine, but there were some lines that were oddly placed there that really didn't make sense and made his character act out of place. Carrie Mulligan, however, was the star of the show. She presented her character with such emotion and heart that she really made a ton of the scenes feel emotional and gripping. She delivers a great performance that genuinely outshines Cooper, especially when the story soon focuses on her. The rest of the film was just good. The writing could have been better at some parts, the story was delivered greatly, the cinematography was a bit weird in some scenes but looked fantastic in other parts. Maestro is a film that has some hit or misses, but for me it was still an enjoyable film that kept me interested in watching. Next I saw God's Country in my cinema class. This was an insane film to watch in my cinema class since we all went in blind not knowing what this film could offer. We were able to interview the director of the film as well as one of the actors of the film, the film's composer, and one of the production designers which was really cool. It's a film about a woman living in a remote home in Montana where she confronts two hunters who keeps trespassing on her property to go hunting, which pushes her anger and pain to her limits. This is a very slow paced film that really shows you the slow escalation of the problem within the film. It's a film that presents itself in a way where you don't realize what's going to happen. It leads you in a state of worriness and fear. It's unpredictable what, with how it's presented but leave you wanting to know what is going to happen to our main character. God's Country is a film that really shows you the lengths of how far a person's anger can go and how far they are willing to satisfy themselves, even if it means sacrificing everything they have. The acting is great, the cinematography is simple but really brings the mood together to create an immersive atmosphere, the drama is intense and really unsettling once you learn more about these characters, and the ending will leave you absolutely shocked with how everything is resolved. If you haven't seen God's Country yet, give it a watch. It's different, it's unsettling, and it puts you on the edge of your seat. And then I saw Poor Things. Poor Things is quite possibly one of the most weirdest and imaginative films I've ever seen. Emma Stone absolutely delivers her role that both left me in awe and absolutely shocked. The way the film is presented feels artistic, but you can see how creative and imaginative the production design is when you see the city she goes to. The cinematography delivers in a way that makes each scene feel unique in their own right, and captures a really immersive tone within. The acting is superb, the writing is downright fantastic, the story has a few bits that didn't fit well, but there were some parts that were genuine and clever. The musical score is cool, the costume design and makeup look stunning, really brings a ton of character to them. Toward Things, in my opinion, is a good film, but I genuinely don't understand the hype around it. It's weird, it's strange, and the focus on sex is rather uncomfortable to be honest. But what it does best is delivering an imaginative story with great acting and fantastic writing that still makes this film a worthy watch. And then I saw Meet the Feebles. What the actual fuck did I even watch? If you thought Happy Time Murders was raunchy and stupid, then you've never seen the likes of this film. Meet the Feebles is an adult comedy puppet film that was directed by Peter Jackson. Yes, that Peter Jackson, the same director who made King Kong and the Lord of the Rings films. It tells the story of a group of Muppets who perform a family variety show where they struggle to overcome sexual harassment, drugs, robbery, murder, and extortion while getting ready for their big show. Now, I really want to make a review on this film, so I'll keep this short. But this film is stupid. It's raunchy as hell. It's absolutely insane. It suffers heavily from its story and writing, but what it does best is executing a really brutal behind the scenes look at the dark side of Hollywood. It's hilariously bad, but you honestly can't look away from it. The puppetry is phenomenal, they did an incredible job with that, making these characters feel alive, have personality, and have actual feelings within them. You know when they're mad, you know when they're sad. 
the puppetry really brings life to these characters. The production is well done, the acting was cheesy, but it's not that bad. You know it's bad, but it's the enjoyable kind of bad. It's hilarious watching how insane this film can get. Honestly, I question myself why I was even watching this film in the first place. Overall, this film is disgusting and stupid, but there's some charm within this film that barely makes this a decent and funny watch. Then I rewatched Clue for the 30th time. Again, I'm gonna make a review on this film. To, to put it simply, this is still one of my favorite films of all time. It's clever, it's funny, it's creative with its acting and slapstick. It's one of the most entertaining movies I've ever seen in my entire life that I can just rewatch over and over again and never get sick of it. It's fucking Clue, and it's still an extremely fun movie to watch. Next, I saw Past Lights in my cinema class. I've been wanting to watch this film for the longest time and I finally got to watch it in my cinema class. And we got to interview the publicist who promoted the film to get Oscar nominations, which was cool. Past Lives tells the tale of two childhood friends who were separated when they were kids and are now reunited as adults where they reconnect and allow a lingering love that was hidden away to resurface. It's a film that really needs to be seen in order to feel the emotional aspects. It's a bittersweet love story where it presents one of my favorite ideas for a love story. You never got the chance to ask your childhood sweetheart out. Now that you've reunited with him or her, are those feelings coming back? And if so, can they be connected again? The film presents itself in a way where we really don't root for them. We just have to watch them go through this important moment. The acting is phenomenal. The writing is really well done and captures the hardships and aching pain of missing on a once in a lifetime opportunity to romance someone you loved. It's fantastic. It makes you feel these emotions throughout the entire film. And by the end, it makes you wish that this story should have gone in a different direction. But that's the theme with this film. We all go through different paths in our lives. Where those paths take us, that's where we'll end up. Not every path will lead to what we want. Our paths lead us to the life that was destined to be ours. And Past Lives does a great job showcasing that type of message and story. Next I saw The Zone of Interest. The Zone of Interest has a really interesting idea for its story. While it really immerses you into the film with its absolutely phenomenal sound design, production design, and atmosphere, I can't say the same thing about its overall execution. To me, the film felt rather boring, with many of the scenes either lasting longer than usual or not really having a connection to what's happening at this moment. The cinematography is gorgeous and the lighting in some shots look really cool, but I think this film wasn't really for me. Even if I tried to enjoy it for what it is, I found the film to be boring most of the time. So sadly, I never got into the hype for this film. Then I saw an exclusive class screening of The Fall Guy. I already made a review on this, but simply put, The Fall Guy is a love letter to not only stunts and film production as a whole, but action films too. The film is literally a modern take on a classic 80s action flick. It's hilarious, action-packed, entertaining, and best of all, Emily Blunt was literally the star of the film due to her character being so energetic and hilariously smart when it comes to filmmaking. Her chemistry with Brian Gosling is unlike anything I've ever seen before. It's perfect, and you have to see this film just to see how well they do together. It's insane, fast-paced, and has a ton of heart within. You're absolutely going to love this film when it comes out in theaters next month. And if you want to know more of my thoughts on this film, I already made a review on it, so go check it out when you have the time. Next I saw Imaginary. Damn, this was just terrible. Imaginary is one of those films where the core concept of the film is absolutely phenomenal, but what the hell happened with the execution of it? It tells the story of a young woman and her family moving back into her childhood home, where she finds out that her imaginary friend has been awaiting her return and is looking for revenge. The production design and story concept is fantastic, but the film does a terrible job of executing that type of story. It falls flat due to its poor writing, subpar acting, rushed character development between two specific characters in a story that honestly feels unoriginal. Imaginary had everything to create a really unique story but fails to deliver it and instead delivers a bland, boring, and uninspiring horror movie that barely does anything to be different. Creating a horror movie focusing on imaginary friends is a good concept, but you need to build upon that concept in order to make it understandable and give reason for it to exist. But this film just doesn't, and it's sad that it didn't go beyond with what it had for its story. Finally, we ended this month off with the Casa Grande's movie, and man, 
what a plain ass movie to watch for the end of the month. Funnily enough, I had never seen a single episode of the Casa Grandes, so that's perfect, right? I did watch a couple of episodes of The Loud House, but that was really it. While The Loud House movie was actually and honestly one of the worst movies I've ever seen in my entire life, the Casa Grandes movie is still a pretty weak film. But there are some things that make it enjoyable. It is better than the Wild House movie, that's for sure. But some issues within the film get really annoying, repetitive, and downright predictable. While the animation is actually quite good and the film's climax is one of the best parts of the entire film, you really can't ignore how predictable the story can be, how annoying some of the jokes and characters are, or even how underdeveloped these new characters are. The acting itself was pretty decent, and while the writing suffered within some comedy moments, it does a nice job handling the more heartfelt scenes. The Casa Grande's movie is a movie for the fans of the show. While I myself am not a fan of the show, I still thought this was an okay film. Nothing too amazing, but nothing too terrible. It's a movie that's just there to exist. And that was my movie diary for March of 2024. And wow, I don't think I've ever seen this many movies in one month period. This month was pretty good all things considered. We did get some movies that were pretty bad or just okay, but there were some films that were genuinely great films to watch. And out of all the films that I saw this month, i say it was either between Doom Part 2 and The Fall Guy that I consider to be the best films I saw this month. Now, what am I going to be watching this month in April? I mean, we're already in April, so I might as well just say like I'll probably be watching them like right now or soon, but I'm definitely not watching Ghostbusters Frozen Empire, that's for sure. But I do have some films that I will be watching this month. I actually just saw Monkey Man due to my university doing a special screening, which I already made a review on, so you can go check that out. But besides that, I'll also be watching the new Spy X Family film, the Bob Marley movie, Late Night with the Devil, Civil War, Argyle, Roadhouse, Drive My Car, Ocean Waves, just to name a few. So hopefully I'll be able to watch them. Anyways, thank you so much for watching. Hopefully you guys enjoy this new type of video. It's a good way for me to talk about some films that I don't really feel like deserves an actual video. Or just, uh, I don't know, I don't, I don't think these uh, movies will do well as an actual review. That's just my opinion though. But it's also cool to show you guys what I was able to watch this month. Also follow me on Letterboxd, it will be on the description below. So go follow me and see, let's see if we have like, you know, common interest in some films. So yeah, please go give all these films a watch and let me know if you either like them or not. I'm curious to see what you think about these films. Like and subscribe and I'll talk to you all later.